Uh, right, so yes, I am Jess Cope, I'm the Data Services Lead uh, at the British Library. Um, been doing this research data thing for a little while um, at various universities before I moved to British University, British Library, um, including at Imperial, hi Henry, and at Bath, hi uh, Nushrat. <laughs> Um, but the, I guess you might briefly wonder why the British Library is interested in something like this. Um, and one of the reasons for that is that um, in order to make data sort of open and available uh, and have some kind of guarantees that it's accessible in the long term, uh, you need you need identifiers for it because those identifiers allow you to get from some identifier to where the data actually is. You need those identifiers to be persistent, um, and the persistent identifier that's emerged for data sets is the DOI. Um, and the British Library was involved eleven years ago now uh, in setting up uh, the the data sites service for providing. DOIs to data sets, um, which is now um, used increasingly, not only for data sets, but also for software code, for uh, presentations, gray literature, uh, all sorts of the those kind of non-traditional uh, and frequently not necessarily peer-reviewed articles um, and research outputs that still need an identifier. Uh, so, I am going to, I'm very aware looking at the list of participants uh, that there are several people in the audience who are far more qualified than I am to give this talk. So um, we'll see how this goes. I'm gonna talk a little bit about what we mean when we talk about research data, um, what's involved in publishing it and citing it uh, and where to learn more. Um, so research data, to be very specific and clear about our definitions, research data is text, documents, um, images, maps, spreadsheets, uh, stuff that's come out of that bit of equipment in the corner of the lab. Any source of information that you use to support a research conclusion or argument is uh, ultimately what we're talking about um, when we talk about research data. Um, by extension, then research data management is considering all of that stuff, uh, making sure that the data is safe and secure and documented and accurate, findable, useful, preserved, appropriately shared, making sure that you can actually do something with it. Um, and at the end of the day, all researchers do research data management. Um, some do more of it than others. Um, and we include in that as well, planning all of the actions necessary to do all of those other things. Um, so a brief aside, uh, because it's always useful uh, to be clear about language. I try to consistently treat the word data as a mass name. Um, so you'll hear me using singular pronouns with it. Other people prefer to treat it as plural, talking about these data rather than this data. Honestly, I don't mind what you do as long as you're consistent. I'm going to try and be consistent myself. Um, so yes, it's about data, uh, but the wider picture, um, and Sarah's already done a really good job of outlining this, is it's about the whole story of the research. Um, the article is the story of the research, um, but it's not the whole of the research. Um, you also need to include uh, and think about how you communicate the methodology. Um, you probably have a method section in your paper, but it might be quite short. Something to think about. Uh, the codes that you use to analyze the data, um, any intellectual property that's generated out of the research, um, any other primary and secondary sources you use, public engagement activities, creative output, maybe not um, so relevant in for most of us in the field of science, um, but there are honestly some quite interesting things that come out that can come out of the intersection of the sciences and the arts. Um, Wellcome Trust uh, have quite done quite an interesting piece of work on this. They call it outputs management, 
Uh, and while a lot of funders will ask you to submit a data management plan when you apply for funding, Wellcome Trust actually asks for an outputs management plan that considers all of this as a whole. Um, so we often talk about open data. Um, open data at its simplest is data which is available for others to reuse without a charge and without unreasonable restrictions. Um, unreasonable is quite an important word there because there may well be some reasonable restrictions. Um, we'll have a look at that in more detail in a bit. Um, and the other word that we've already heard repeated quite, the other phrase we've heard repeated quite a few times today is FAIR, FAIR data. Um, and FAIR is an acronym that stands for findable, accessible, interoperable and reusable. Um, so the data and the metadata describing it needs to be findable. Uh, there's no point in publishing it if no one can find it's there because no one's going to uh, actually use it. Uh, it needs to be accessible. Uh, it needs to be in some kind of form that people actually, once they've discovered that it exists, can get at it. Uh, whether that's by downloading it or requesting that you send it to them or anything else like that. Um, ideally, you should be aiming for it to be interoperable. So it should be in consistent standard data formats uh, with consistent standard metadata describing it so that it can be integrated with data from other sources, data from other labs. Um, and it should ideally be reusable, so well enough documented and understood uh, that you can actually use it as the input to further research. Um, so the reason I've got both of those side by side on the slide there um, is that I want to make this point that not all data can be open. Um, again, I'm going to refer back to Sarah's slide. slide. There are plenty of situations where you just you can't make data fully open for people to download. Um, but generally, even when you can't make your data open, you can still make it fair. Uh, you can still uh, publish it in a way that it is findable, accessible, interoperable and reusable, um, even if it doesn't necessarily comply with the kind of free openness that we've come to associate with open data. Um, so there are some big opportunities for thinking about data in this way. Um, it can help you to raise your profile, raise your influence of a research, as a researcher, um, and that's the projects that you work on, the department that you work in, the university that you work in. Um, particularly when we know that publishing an article, there are delays around um, some of which are reasonable, some of which are less reasonable uh, around uh, peer reviewing and editing and copy editing and layout and all of the processes that go on. Uh, and it can be kind of up to 12, 18 months from submitting an article uh, before it's actually available for the public to read. Um, so making the underlying data available is a really good way of having an extra channel to publicize your research, publicize that the work that you've done exists and that you have done it uh, and stamp your claim on that research area and the discovery. Um, and doing that in a rigorous and open way, um, so counterintuitively reduces the possibility of being scooped um, because you can then say, hey, you've come along uh, and you've claimed all the credit for this work that I had actually done uh, and staked my claim to six months ago. Uh, it's a good way of attracting collaborators. Um, there are a few things better for increasing the trust of a potential collaborator than putting them in a position where they can come along and inspect the data that you collect, uh, understand from that the kind of work that you do, how you structure your data, how you work, um, what kinds of things you're interested in uh, and how your work could potentially mesh with theirs. Um, and so making your data open is a really good way of attracting collaborators that might have passed you by before. Uh, it is a way to get more citations if that's something that you're interested in. Uh, and it is still something 
maybe it shouldn't be, but it is still something that does tend to have some weight uh, in the academic world. Uh, not only can you get citations directly to the data sets uh, that you've made available, but also there's some evidence that um, if you publish an article and the underlying data for that article is also available to examine, that article tends to get more citations as well. Um, and the reasons behind that, behind that are fairly straightforward. If the data is available, then the conclusions in the art article are easier to sort of challenge and probe and therefore come out more trustworthy. Uh, and also it's more easy to build on that work uh, with new research, which ultimately is what causes new papers to cite old papers. It enables new types of research. It's increasingly possible now to take some data from over here and some data from over here, bring them together with maybe a little bit of extra that you've collected yourself from your own experiments uh, and unlock knowledge that was always in there in that information but just wasn't accessible because of because it hasn't been combined in the right way. Um, and finally it improves transparency. Um, so funders particularly, especially when they're um, government affiliated, are very, very interested in value for money and making your data available is a way of demonstrating to them that you are doing the work that they feel that they're paying for and that the taxpayer is paying for. But also, as I've already mentioned, it does make your work easier to examine and probe and therefore uh, ultimately more trustworthy. So how do you publish data? Um, so I try to split this up into two separate sections. Uh, delivery, which is how you actually get the data from you to someone else. Uh, and advertising, which is how you make people aware and draw them in um, and make them interested in actually using that data. So in terms of delivery mechanisms, you really want to pick one and one only. Um, the reason for that is if you start publishing your data in several different places, um, you very quickly find that people are confused about which one is the original or which one is the official version uh, or whatever. If you update a data set by appending new results to it, for example, or by correcting errors in it, um, the more places you've published it, the more places you have to make those corrections. Uh, and generally, it, it just gets more confusing the more places you try to put it. So try and try and pick one of these mechanisms. Um, so the ideal, uh, if you possibly can, is to submit your data to some kind of repository or archive. Um, those are set up uh, with kind of long term preservation and archiving plans in place. Um, so that the data will be preserved and kept available and accessible uh, long before you've moved on to a new project, long after you've moved on to a new project. Um, and that means that you don't then have to cope with this kind of slowly accreting pile of your past data to maintain. Um, if it's sensitive, there are some data repositories and archives that have facilities for that, um, that can make data available um, under some kind of password restriction or um, after a vetting process, or even in some extreme cases, you actually have to go and physically visit the place where the data is stored um, and your results are checked to make sure that you're not just taking away anything that you shouldn't do. Um, but you're all, you also have the option of releasing the data under some kind of data sharing agreement on request. Um, and if it's really big, uh, maybe it's not practical for you to upload it, you, for you to upload several petabytes to a data repository and for someone else to download several petabytes onto their uh, local, I would say computer, but you won't fit that on a computer. You're, you're already looking at downloading it onto a large cluster. Um, so it's totally appropriate in those kinds of cases to send it via a courier on the hard drives or some other physical storage medium. Um, 
and in all these cases there may be some costs associated with that which it would be reasonable to expect the person requesting the data to pay um, we're not talking about making this a profit making enterprise we're talking about um, covering the costs um, and another thing that's, that I haven't mentioned on this slide that's becoming increasingly common is that if you've got a really big data set, and if you've got a really small data set, but this makes sense, um, is putting it somewhere that alongside the facilitate facilities to analyze it. So upload storing your data in a vault in a HPC cluster, a national HPC cluster maybe, or uploading it into the cloud. Um, so that people can do their analysis where the data is, rather than having to bring the data to where their analysis is. Um, some other things that you might consider options, which I would, you, there might be specialised occasions when you would use them, but I would really encourage you to avoid them. Supplementary material in a journal. Um, as Sarah mentioned already, the kind of data that you can include in a table, in a journal, we're kind of past that age now. We don't collect data sets small enough. Um, and still, typically, if you're providing supplementary material uh, to go with a journal article, it will be, um, they will only accept it in a PDF form anyway, which is a horrible, horrible format to try and use data from. Uh, so please try to avoid that. Um, uploading it to a lab, department, or worth a personal website okay, you're making it available, you're making it easy for people to download, uh, but there's no way that you are able to guarantee the long-term availability of that. Um, if the department's restructured, if the lab's closed, if you move to a different job, um, that could well disappear forever. Um, and finally, although I've mentioned that there are mentioned the cases where you might want to make the data available on request, don't do that unless you've got a really good reason. Uh, if for no other reason than you are creating lots of extra work for yourself. Uh, so, in terms of choosing a data repository, uh, increasingly research organisations have their own data repository, so it's worth looking into that. Um, if you are in a research area where data sharing is quite standard now, um, you might well find a discipline specific repository or archive. Those are really good because they tend to have specialized facilities for storing that specialized data type for querying and finding sets and subsets of it um, and understanding the preservation needs of it as well. Uh, and there's a really good um, directory, if you like, of discipline specific, specific and more general purpose repositories at re3data.org. Um, if you're lucky enough to work in a university that has a university library, ask a librarian for recommendations as well. Um, managing information is something that librarians have done since the dawn of time, and they um, typically these days have a lot of expertise in data sharing as well as the more conventional paper books and journals. Um, so then advertising your data, you've picked one place to one mechanism for delivering it. But when it comes to advertising, you can do as many of these as you like. Um, first and foremost, obviously, I would say this, um, I'm all about DOIs, uh, get a DOI for it. Uh, typically, if you publish it in um, a large repository or archive, those will assign DOIs for you um, when you publish it. Um, if you then write a paper about that data, which is quite likely, uh, make sure that you cite your own data sets in your papers, um, or if you haven't, aren't able to cite them directly, uh, include a data, avail data availability statement, um, which is just a, a short one or two sentences saying the data supporting the conclusions in this article are available from here. Um, publish a descriptor article. Uh, you're welcome, Sarah. Um, that's an increasingly uh, available method of advertising your data. Uh, and it's a nice way because it allows you to give a more 
um, human readable context to that data as well. Um, promote it at conferences, um, link it from your personal website. Don't upload it for download from your personal website, but by all means have a list of where you can get all your data sets from. Uh, talk about it on social media. Uh, any, any other ways you can think of getting it out there, that's great. Um, and then finally, cite your data. Um, and ultimately, if you've done all of that other stuff, uh, or even some of it, this is fairly straightforward. Make sure you get a DOI. As I mentioned, most repositories or archives offer this. Um, and follow your department or publisher's referencing guide. Uh, most referencing, major referencing guides now include guidance on how to cite data sets. If you have a new use bibliographic database uh, software, uh, and you should, if you don't, it will make your life much easier. Um, you can use that to generate the citation for your data set. Most of them now include uh, a record type for data sets. Uh, or if you've got a DOI, then you can get this wonderful tool. It doesn't have to be a data set DOI. Any, de any DOI works with this tool. Uh, go to citation.crosssite.org, uh, paste in the DOI, choose one, choose your preferred referencing format from the several thousand that are available. Uh, and it will generate a correctly formatted citation for you. And that's basically it. Um, some years ago, uh, I would be talking more about different ways you could mention your data, but uh, increasingly journal editors are accepting that a data set is a valid thing that you can cite. Um, so if you can possibly do that, do it. Um, so just as an example, this is what a data set citation looks like. This is in the, the APA style. Um, and it looks like any other citation that you would expect to see. You've got all of the key inf identifying information there. You've got the creators of it, uh, John Borgi and Anna van Rulik. Uh, you've got a publication date, so you know where it was from. You've got a title so that you can um, understand at a glance of what the data is about. Um, some data sets do sort of evolve and you'll find version numbers being assigned, which is useful. So then you want to make sure that you cite the specific version that you used. Um, in APA style, you also flag up in square brackets that this is a data set. Dryad is the location. It's the publisher, if you like, of the data set. Uh, and then you've got a DOI and that's all you really need. Um, so last, uh, last few minutes, I would briefly touch on a couple of other things that are relevant. Um, licensing is something that you really need to be thinking about with respect to your data and all information that you share and all information that you reuse. Um, and the reason this is important is that licenses are what specifies what anyone other than the, the owner of that um, expression of the information can do with it. If there's no license attached to it, you can look at it, but you can't do anything else. Um, so to people who kind of feel that they can stick their software or data up on GitHub and it's open, it's kind of there in a read-only form. Uh, you can't do anything with it unless you've also attached a license that says, oh yeah, if you've downloaded this data set, I permit you to do these things. Um, so there are different kinds of licenses that depend on the type of the content. Um, for general creative works, um, and all of these are licenses that have been drawn up by some very clever people uh, for you to reuse, so you don't have to kind of think about um, drawing up a license from scratch. Uh, and that's useful because it reduces the work you have to do, but it's also useful because other people coming along will recognize these licenses and will be able to see at a glance what they can do with that information rather than having to read the full text of it, uh, which they pr probably should still do at some point. So general creative works, there's a great, great suite of licenses from um, a collective called Creative Commons. Um, for open data, uh, there are the open data commons licenses and also some open government licenses uh, relevant. 
for open software specifically, there's the, the venerable GNU public license, um, MIT, BSD, Apache licenses. The reason software, the reason software and data, it's important to use licenses that are specialized for those things is because they have kind of particular aspects uh, that get legally very weird without being too specific if you try to use something a bit more general like a Creative Commons license. Uh, so then within those different types of license, there are some common types of restrictions or requirements that you'll see. The most common is attribution. So an attribution license says, if you reuse this, you must give me credit for it. Uh, no derivatives means that you can use this, but you can't, but you, and you can share it, but you can only share it in the original form that I shared it, shared it in. Um, that's typically quite useful for things like um, uh, opinion papers and things where you're stating something as part of a whole argument and you don't want that to be taken, parts of that to be quoted out of context. Um, share alike is an interesting one. This kind of share alike thing means that if you reuse my data set, um, then you can do whatever you like with it but you must make your derived versions available under the same license or a compatible license with the same requirements. Um, and finally, there's a non-commercial clause, which you'll sometimes see, which says you can do what you like with this as long as you're not making a profit for it, from it. Uh, and for most academic research, I'd advise you to steer clear of that because there hasn't really been any test cases yet uh, and no one's really sure uh, whether all academic research actually counts as non-commercial or not, uh, because we're increasingly, the sector's increasingly having to act like uh, a profit-making business. Um, so that's quite a whistle-stop tour. There's a whole load of other things uh, that come into this umbrella of research data management that support the end goal of publishing and sharing and preserving it. Particularly data management planning is something that's worth doing. Um, and you can find some really good examples and some really good templates provided by the Digital Curation Center. Uh, this is just the beginning. There's some, there's various online resources that you can use to learn more about this. Um, also look out for the training that your IT department and your library are providing. Um, and that's me. Uh, thank you very much for your attention.